Well, I think it's time we can go ahead and get started. Um, good morning and welcome everybody. I just wanna thank you for attending our first virtual breast cancer survivorship care planning wellness retreat. My name is Dana Haley. I'm the research program coordinator for the Breast Center at Mayo Clinic Florida. And we are very happy to have you guys here and are excited for this great turnout. Um, before we get started, we just wanna take a quick moment for a little housekeeping. Um, just so you guys know, this uh, webinar is being recorded. We actually plan to post it on Mayo Clinic's YouTube page after the event. Um, everyone is muted by default, um, but if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, you can type them into either the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, just to, if you are not familiar with Zoom, a little background on both of those, the chat box gives you the option to send a message either uh, straight to the panelists, um, which would be our presenters, or to the panelists and attendees for everybody to see. And then the Q&A box would just go straight to the panelists only. And you also have the option using that box to remain anonymous if you'd like. So you can send a question to either one of those places and I'll be manning uh, both of those boxes throughout the presentation to get the questions to the presenters. So we'll take a few breaks during the presentation to answer some questions. And then we'll also have a Q&A session at the very end of the presentation. And if you're having any trouble seeing the slide in its entirety, we're not showing slides yet, but when we do show the slides, if you're having trouble seeing them, um, you should be able to minimize the small little video box on your screen. Um, so now without further ado, let, I wanna turn the time over to our two panelists today, Dr. Dawn Musalem and Beth Boyer, who uh, she'll be helping with the Q&A. Um, a little background on both of them first. Um, Dr. Ms. Salem completed her residency training at Mayo Clinic and has been a physician at Mayo Clinic since 2004. Uh, she transferred from the hospital practice to the Jacoby Center for Breast Health five years ago to pursue her passion, applying lifestyle style medicine to help breast cancer patients discover transformative well-being during and after the breast cancer. Um, she is a 20-year stage four non-Hodgkin's -Hodg uh, cancer survivor, and she experienced through that cancer as a teacher of life. She was energized to be able to help breast cancer patients live their best life ever, guided by the highest quality up-to-date medical evidence available. And her favorite food is raisins. And then also we have Beth Boyer with us. She's a physician's assistant here in the Breast Center. She's worked in cancer care since she became a PA back in 2011. Um, she's been at Mayo Clinic Florida since January 2015 and specifically came to Mayo to work with a breast cancer program. Her inspiration is her mother who ended her battle with metastatic breast cancer in 2011. She wants to give patients information and tools to empower them to have a successful journey, whether it's for prevention, treatment, and survivorship. And if she had to eat one thing for the rest of her life, it would be a salad. She's had one actually almost daily for 20 years and it, she never gets bored with it. It's, it's filling, nutritious, and so many ways you can uh, uh, keep transforming your salad to make it interesting. So with that, I'll let Dr. Ms. Allen take it away. Thank you, Dana. If I have any family members listening, they're laughing when I say raisins because I, I literally have them every day. And every time I have them, I say, I love raisins. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole food. I don't know if it's the most healthy whole food, but gosh, do I love them. All right. So thank you all for, uh, for being here with us today. And, you know, we're here in honor of you. This is Breast Cancer Month, and you are the hero of your breast cancer story. And what I like to tell patients, you know, if we can take our cancer diagnosis and reframe it, such that, as Dana said earlier, make it a teacher of life, then we've discovered perhaps a personal catalyst for action. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is how we can transform our life in various ways, whether it's through nutrition, being more physically fit, or maybe it's through managing our stress better. But those are the various domains we're gonna really focus on today. And I wanna just briefly tell you about how these breast cancer wellness retreats came about, is the fact that when it comes to survivorship care planning, this is the point in a breast cancer patient's journey when they've completed their treatment. So they finished their surgery, their chemotherapy, the radiation, kind of that primary initial first year of treatment. And then it's recommended for accredited cancer centers to deliver a survivorship care plan. The problem with delivering a survivorship care plan is, I'll be honest, it's really checking a box. So to be a, 
a high quality accredited cancer center, we got to make sure we check that box. But at Mayo Clinic, we wanted to do something a little more special and something a little bit more comprehensive for our patients. Mayo Clinic has three sites. So today we're excited to have our Florida patients as well as our Rochester patients. And we felt that rather than limit the ability of attendance to just those particular campuses, we opened up the attendance to the public. And so though some of you who are not Mayo Clinic patients may not have received a survivorship care plan, I do have a few resources on this slide at the bottom to where you can make your own survivorship care plan. At the Florida campus, we just simply send our survivorship care plans to our patients via the patient portal. It's a very informal practice. And then we embed the education with this retreat. At our Rochester campus, their survivorship care plan is actually delivered at a nurse practitioner appointment where they receive some face-to-face -face education. But in working with our Rochester colleagues, we felt that some of this lifestyle education isn't something we typically have time to during that face-to-face -face component. So what I just wanna show you here is basically what a survivorship care plan entails. What, what does it even have on there? It basically should be an overview of your cancer diagnosis in the care team. Generally on your survivorship care plan, you're gonna see the stage of your diagnosis, and then you'll see the outline of the treatments you received with the dates that those treatments were delivered. And then at the very end of the care plan, you see is really the briefest part, but this is where we have wellness recommendations. We have a few sentences about what to accept, expect about long-term side effects. And then we highlight the necessary follow-up care with the primary care provider. The reason the survivorship care plan is really beneficial, it is a nice historical review of all the cancer treatments you've received. And it's something you can share with your primary care doctor. You know, oftentimes primary care doctors receive very detailed medical documents of what treatments you're receiving. But in all fairness to your busy primary care doctor, they very well don't have time to read those very long documents. So this would serve as a very concise review of everything you have completed in your cancer treatment for you to share with your primary care doctor, since that's the doctor who's gonna care for you once your cancer care has been completed. So what we're gonna focus on today is this really brief part of the survivorship care plan. And in my opinion, what matters most about the survivorship care plan is the educational component about how our cancer survivors can make their lives better. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at one area that I think is really, really important. And I know both Beth and I see this very often. Women come into our survivorship clinic or uh, you know, our patients who have undergone breast cancer treatment go in and see their medical oncologist and they have side effects from their treatment, whether that's insomnia or maybe a little memory loss or numbness and tingling in their hands or feet or weight gain. There's many side effects to treatment and oftentimes that visit may seem a little fast paced but it's very important that you share with your medical team what side effects you've experienced from treatment because there are many different ways we can help to mitigate those side effects. It's also important now that I highlight to you, all of you who are listening today, that at all three Mayo Clinic sites, Rochester, Arizona, and Florida, we have integrative uh, consultations that we are doing virtually. So even if you're not a Mayo Clinic patient, you can certainly call any one of those sites request an integrative virtual consultation. And those consults are designed to really dive deep into well-being and to try to mitigate some of these side effects. So we would love to meet any of you if you're interested in those appointments, you just call the main appointment line. Additionally, one of the important elements of survivorship care is talking about the signs and symptoms of recurrence. Now, this is kind of the elephant in the room when you see your doctor, right? No one wants to bring this up but it's still very important that the discussion is had. And the take home message that I share with my patients is, if you have any new symptom for more than two weeks, say you develop a new cough, chances are that it's a viral upper respiratory tract infection or maybe something as simple as allergies. But if those symptoms are continuing for longer than two weeks, rather than stay home and stress about it, it's much better for you to share that with your medical team so they can make sure there's no reason to consider doing a chest X-ray or perhaps some further imaging. Let's say it's memory loss. Let's just say that your life has been a little bit more stressed than usual. You're having a difficult time managing stress at that time. And maybe your short-term memory, you're just forgetting things. You know, you walk into a room to go get something and you forget what you went into the room to go get. Nine times out of 10, it's probably that stress that's impacting that memory. But still, it's important for us to 
to kind of determine is this a side effect from treatment or could this be a side effect of something else? So again, just that open discussion and what I share with my patients is the two week mark is when I wanna hear about your symptoms. And what we wanna do is we wanna harness that fear and instead cultivate empowerment. Education should equal empowerment. It should not equal fear, okay? And so now we're gonna kind of get onto the fun stuff. That was the business side of things. We have to cover the important elements of the survivorship um, care plan for those patients who are attending our, our, our meeting today who received their survivorship care plan and were wondering why these two things were combined. But I wanna focus our attention to this photograph. And this is all too common for the majority of you who have recently completed your breast cancer treatment. At the time of your diagnosis, this probably felt quite familiar, right? Everything was just kind of a mess. The water's all over the floor. So what do we do in conventional medicine? We're quick to mop up the floor. So think about this. This is our surgery, our chemotherapy, our radiation. So we clean up the mess, but if we don't look at the faucet or in some situations, the cause of the disease, or if we don't fix triggers that could perhaps increase the risk of recurrence in the future, then we haven't done a thorough job. So the faucet in this analogy is unhealthy lifestyle. And if we don't turn off that faucet from flooding all over the floor, then the cancer is at a higher risk of coming back, or maybe even a more critical disease can occur, like heart disease. That's the number one thing women with breast cancer actually pass away of, is heart disease. It's not even their breast cancer. So we want to make sure we optimize how we live so we can reduce the risk of these other diseases. And then of course we can help to reduce the side effects of treatment if women live healthier lifestyles. And so the first thing we're gonna point to here is the American Institute for Cancer Research. You know, there's so much information on the internet and oftentimes when I meet with patients, they're so frustrated because they don't know what to believe. This is an exceptional resource where you can get a lot of very valuable information. And what they've done here is they've designed these cancer recommendations. They can be used for cancer prevention, but as you can see here in the arrow, they can also be used following a, following a cancer, any cancer, but particularly for what we're talking about today, a breast cancer diagnosis. And so the first thing we're gonna talk about is gonna be be a healthy weight. This is a hard thing with a lot of our breast cancer survivors. So what you're gonna see here is there's gonna be a poll. And I'm going to ask you all a question. Bear with me with some of the technical difficulties. This is the first time we've used this type of polling. Usually, pre-COVID, we did these retreats in person. So I believe that you could all can see this poll now. And so the first question I have is, did you gain weight during breast cancer treatment? These answers are anonymous, so feel free to cast your vote. Number one would be no. Number two would be, I gained weight, but less than five pounds. Number three would be, I gained about five to 10 pounds. And four would be, I gained more than 10 pounds. I'll give you a few extra seconds here, and then I'm gonna let you all see the votes. This is extremely interesting to me. And it's the total opposite of what we expect. Look at this. So 30% of women gained at least five to 10 pounds. And another 30% of women gained more than 10 pounds. So over half of the patients that are attending today gained a, a fair amount of weight during the breast cancer treatment. Now, I know when the majority of women come into the room to see me at the time of their breast cancer diagnosis, they envision a time in their life when they're gonna lose weight. And so do a lot of their caregivers. And so what happens is, you know, they're fed a lot of food or people bring them really unhealthy desserts or chocolates or cakes because they don't want them to lose weight during cancer treatment. But actually the opposite is, generally what we see uh, during breast cancer treatment. Now I'm gonna ask you another poll, not to bombard you with too many questions, but I'm curious about this next poll since we saw that over 60% of you did gain weight. So if you gained weight during your treatment, which statement describes you best? I haven't tried to lose weight yet because I do not know where to start. Or two, I am trying to lose weight, but the pounds aren't coming off. Or three, I've lost some weight that I gained during cancer treatment, but I have more to lose. Or number four, I lost all the weight I gained during breast cancer treatment. So I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, good. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and show you these answers. So really interesting here. So look at everyone has tried to start losing weight. So congratulations, I'm so proud of all of you. That motivation is really key. But look at number two, I'm trying to lose weight but the pounds just aren't coming off. And number three, I have lost some weight. Um, I gained during breast cancer treatment, but I have more to lose. That's only about 14% of people. And then only 14% lost all the weight. So the majority here, 71% have not lost the amount of weight that we really want to try losing. So I, I know, and that's what we're here for today is to kind of give you some education to help guide you during this really frustrating time. Um, so let's just take a look at this. So more than half, and this is exactly, almost exactly what we saw in our poll, more than half of women who undergo chemotherapy for early stage breast cancer have significant gains in fat mass. And not just that they gain some of that fat mass, but they lose some of their lean mass. And only 10% of women, and look, this is, this is right in with our numbers. We were at 14%. Only 10% of women with breast cancer related weight gain return to their pretreatment weight. So it's so interesting that what the science and the studies have shown us is exactly what we're seeing on this webinar today. But the problem is, is that weight gain after a breast cancer diagnosis, it doesn't help us optimize the cancer outcome. So here we give you chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery with the hopes of curing you of your disease. And we feel quite confident that we did, but we've got to make sure that we guide you with lifestyle opportunities to make sure we're really enhancing the overall uh, wellness of our patient. And one of the critical ways to approach weight loss is through physical activity. So let's talk about physical activity. I have another poll for you first though. I think these polls are so interesting. So if you don't mind, let's go ahead and answer these questions. Do you exercise? So number one, nope, I don't like to sweat. Number two, I don't exercise, but I'm active. So that's good. We like to hear activity. How about number three? I exercise at less than one hour a week. Number four, about one to three hours a week of exercise. Number five, three to five hours a week to exercise. Or number six, I'm addicted to exercise and I exercise more than five hours a week. So go ahead and cast your votes. And I am, I joke with people sometimes. I always say, in life, you should like have these aha moments or you know, do things in life that give you chills. And this gives me chills. This is super exciting. So I'm gonna go ahead and share, you, share these results with you. So look at this. Over almost 40% of you are exercising three to five hours a week. This is incredible. And this does not surprise me because there's kind of something we call a selection bias, right? All of you who chose to be here today are very motivated people to begin with because you're spending almost two hours of your time hearing us share this information. But look at this. I just want to applaud you all for having that commitment to exercise. That is incredible. But let's look here. Another almost 20% have one to three hours of exercise. So there we have over 50% of people getting nice levels of exercise in. And we see that very few of you aren't exercising at all. About 11 folks participating in the webinar today don't exercise at all. Maybe after listening to some of what we talk about today, we can get you moving a little bit. Or if it's because of a side effect of treatment that's li limiting your exercise, maybe you can set up an appointment with one of us so we can help you with that. So thank you for taking time to uh, share those answers. This is a problem, right? A lot of Americans, over 80% 80, 80 of Americans don't do as much physical activity as recommended, believe it or not. So being physically active needs to be a part of your daily activities. You need to walk more and sit less. And in fact, for every two hours of sitting, they have linked an increased risk of many cancers. So it's a good idea if you have a smartwatch or a Fitbit or just a simple timer at your desk if you're working to maybe set it for 90 minutes and every 90 minutes you get up and do some movement. And we're gonna do that a little later in the webinar because I don't wanna be a part of the reason we're sitting too long. So we're gonna go through a little bit more material and I'm gonna get you all up, I promise, okay? But let's talk about the benefits of exercise. So the benefits of exercise are incredible. It's extremely exciting, you know, when we look at how much powerful good the exercise can offer us. You know, a lot of folks come in and they talk about the adverse hormones that their body may be exposed to from food. But if we exercise, we can actually reduce those unfavorable hormones in our body. We feel better. Our overall well-being is better. People sleep better. They have reduced fatigue because of that enhanced sleep and it just improves their energy just because they're exercising. 
They have better memory. Um, we see that they have cardiovascular benefits. Again, that's really critical, right? Because we know heart disease is one of the number one um, issues when it comes to female-related death. Um, reduces inflammation. I can't tell you how many times a week I see patients and they say that the reason they're eating a particular diet they're eating is to reduce inflammation. Exercise can help you with that as well. How about enhancing the immune system? This is a particularly important time we talk about enhancing the immune system with COVID-19. So exercise is critical for that. And it improves physical functioning. Our bodies feel better. What about aromatase inhibitors? And you know, that's actually the next slide. Um, coming up, I'm going to share with you is that our body feels better when we exercise. But before I move on to this, to that slide, I want to share a few of these studies with you, not to get, you know, deep in the trenches with research, but I think these numbers really matter. So there's many very large studies that look at the impact of physical activity for breast cancer survivors. And they see time and time again that three to five hours of exercise, this is what the majority of you are doing who are listening to us today, that results in a 50% lower risk of the cancer coming back, a 50% improved survival from breast cancer and all causes. So isn't that incredible? Here's another nice study. I like this one at the very end because I think that this is a really easy one to implement. Just walking 30 minutes, six days a week and consuming five or more vegetables or fruits a day resulted in a 50% survival advantage compared to women who didn't do that. So. I think that's pretty incredible. You know, when you sit in the room with your medical oncologist and see the benefit of chemotherapy, the numbers start to look this powerful. We have to add exercise to those, to those conventional chemotherapies, it's critical. So here's that uh, slide I was sharing with you. Look at all these studies showing that exercise can help to reduce those joint pains related to aromatase inhibitors. This is probably one of the most common things those of us in the survivorship clinic and our breast oncology center here that are women undergoing aromatase inhibitor therapy experience, it's reported that up to 30% of women on aromatase inhibitors can experience these joint pains. I didn't ask this question as a poll, but I should have. It would have been kind of interesting to see what percentage of our patients are experiencing those joint pains. The number of uh, women on this webinar today experience those joint pains may be relatively low because a lot of you are exercising. But again, it's just one more thing to point out as a benefit of exercise that directly can benefit breast cancer survivors. Now, this slide has a lot of information on it, and I wanna invite you if you have your uh, phone with you or something that could take a picture of a screen, this may be a nice photograph. Um, this particular uh, image here is showing us how many days a week of aerobic activity is important. So we wanna encourage working up to three to five days a week. And how many minutes? Well, you wanna start slow if you're not exercising currently, but you wanna work your way up to trying to do 20 to 30 minutes every day. With breast cancer, the research actually points to more is better. So keep that in mind, more is better. And the other benefit that we're seeing with breast cancer research is that you can break up this activity. It does not have to be all at once. So say you're really busy with your family in the morning, but you can only get maybe about five to 10 minutes of just walking around the house. That's fine, but you know later on in the day you can get a 20 minute walk in. What about our folks out there that it's just really hard to fit in exercise? You have young kids, you work a full-time job, and you just cannot fit it into your daily schedule. There has been a recent study published with breast cancer survivors looking at just that. So it looked at recreational activity. And what it found is that those folks who were recreationally active, whether that's cleaning the house, grocery shopping, running the kids around, kicking the soccer ball with your kids, you name it, being recreationally active actually showed very similar benefit to those people that were doing formal activity. So the take home message here again is be active. We don't wanna just think about cardiovascular or aerobic type exercise. We wanna think about strength training too. And so ideally we wanna recommend two to three sessions a week of strength training exercises. These aren't reasons you have to go to the gym. You can easily do these exercises in your own home. Most all cancer centers, whether that's Mayo Clinic or the cancer center you're being cared at, do have exercise rehabilitation specialists. It's a wonderful consultation to participate in 
that can help individualize your strength training regimen for you. We know that folks after a breast cancer diagnosis and surgery sometimes can have lymphedema, and sometimes that can limit the ability for people to participate with strength training in a way that they feel comfortable with without some guidance. So I would encourage you to talk to your doctor and ask if one of those exercise rehabilitation consultations may benefit you. So next, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn to the nutritional part of it. And what I would share is that this is probably the part that when folks come in to see me, this is the number one thing they want to hear about. They want to hear about the nutritional part because this is where when they do their own research online, it becomes really confusing. And so you see here with the American Institute for Cancer Research, they recommend eating a whole food diet that's rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, beans, limiting fast food and processed food, limiting red meat and processed meat, and limiting consumption of sugar sweetened beverages or sugar. Okay. So let's get started. So, you know, I'm going to just ask this question who's to the left of the screen, who's to the right of the screen, or who's in the middle? Let's go to our poll. You, know, you knew a poll was going to be coming, didn't you? So this first poll is just asking, what type of diet pattern best describes how you usually eat, right? So about 90% of the time, how would you describe your diet? So number one is, is that picture you just saw with that gentleman, and they had all that junk food to the left of the screen. That's a standard American diet. Fast food, not a lot of green, not a lot of vegetables, a lot of processed food. Not a good diet. Number two would be the ketogenic diet. That's a really high fat diet. There's been some, you know, literature that folks come across that they think that's a really healthy diet to do, but I'll let you decide. We're going to talk about that. Number three, the Mediterranean diet. Number four is very similar to the Mediterranean diet. It too is a whole food plant-based diet with some poultry, dairy, and eggs. But number four, these folks that choose number four, you don't eat any red meat at all, okay? The Mediterranean diet is going to allow some red meat. Number five would be vegan, only plants for me, no animals. Or number six, what to eat after a cancer diagnosis is confusing to me, and I hope to learn what to eat today. So go ahead and cast your votes. We have a bunch of superstars today. This is pretty exciting to see this. And remember, it's anonymous. So if you want to pick standard American diet, that's okay, because that's why you're here to learn some of this. Okay, let's take a look at these answers. Okay, I'm going to share the answers with you. So again, we got a bunch of rock stars here, Mediterranean diet, almost 60% of you. So that's great. That's a really easy diet to follow too. Number four is a great answer as well. Whole food diet, avoiding red meat. And vegan, awesome. Just really hard for some patients to uh, be strict in their diet like that. But I applaud anyone who wants to be vegan. Um, number six, we have about 12 participants. A quarter of those listening want to learn what they need to eat. And number one, standard American diet. So number one and six, I think, are going to get a lot of benefit from, from hearing what we're going to talk about here in a moment, okay? Good. Thanks for being honest, guys. That was great. Okay. All right. So here we go. Here, here's a picture of really a, a perfect diet, right? If you're vegan, of course, you don't have to eat the meat. That's a perfect diet, too. But for some people, avoiding meat altogether is really hard. Um, so we kind of pick a more moderate approach to that, and this would be a very moderate approach. And that photo is really the Mediterranean diet. And so when we look at what is the world's healthiest diet, you know, a lot goes into that. Number one is it has to be a diet that the majority of folks can abide by. It can't be so extreme. And so the Mediterranean diet kind of gets that vote. And with the American Institute for Cancer Research, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the Mediterranean diet is the best diet to maintain weight and to help lose weight. So that's great. Let's talk about the Mediterranean diet a little bit more. What is in the Mediterranean diet? This is for those patients uh, who are listening today who weren't quite sure where to start. So let's talk about this. The Mediterranean diet is a whole plant-based diet. What does that mean when I say whole plant-based foods? What I mean by that is it's not processed, right? So if someone is eating a vegetable, or let's, let's think about this. If someone's eating like a, a soy-based fake hamburger, that's kind of processed food many times, right? 
versus if someone's doing maybe a grilled chicken sandwich or a grilled fish sandwich with a lot of vegetables on their sandwich. It's better to do whole foods, ones that aren't processed, okay? It's also gonna include lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds. You're gonna avoid butter and instead you're gonna use extra virgin olive oil. You're gonna use herbs and spices instead of salt. And cooking with herbs and spices can be really fun in the kitchen too. Limiting red meat to just maybe a few times a month, okay? And allowing yourself to have some wild fatty fish maybe one to three times a week. During this presentation, we're gonna talk about some of the healthier choices for fish because that in and of itself can be a little bit confusing. I love this next part with the Mediterranean diet. It says to enjoy meals with family and friends. That is so nice because so often nowadays we eat on the go. We're on the run, we're eating in our car, we're eating with our computer, our cell phone in front of us. But what about enjoying meals with family and friends? What if you're at work and you just eat in your office to catch up on work versus what if you really just take a break to go sit with some of your colleagues and enjoy that togetherness, that connection? You know, this is really, I'm gonna share this with you. What is the number one thing people do that increases longevity? Could it be exercise? Probably it helps, right? Eating good, it helps. But the number one thing is human connection. Key, human connection. Okay, so let's go back to the Mediterranean diet. Also exercise, so we talked about that. But I'm gonna give you a suggested modification because with the Mediterranean diet, oftentimes there is discussion that you can have wine or alcohol. And we know for breast cancer survivors, we have to individualize that a little bit because we don't wanna encourage daily consumption of alcohol. And we'll be talking about that as well, okay? So let's talk about this study. So for those of you eating the Mediterranean diet, you're gonna just get tickled when you hear this study. So I wanna first point out that this is a very small study and it was followed for a very short period of time. So in the medical eyes, that's not ideal, but it's still a really nice take home message. So this study had 300 breast cancer survivors and 199 of them said, yes, I wanna do a Mediterranean diet. The remaining women said, mm -mm, not for me, leave me alone. I just wanna to stick to my regular American, my standard American diet. So after three years, they reevaluated these women and there were 11 cases of breast cancer returning. And in all of those women where the breast cancer returned, they were the women in the regular diet group. So that's a pretty powerful study and the results were actually statistically significant. So I'd like to share that study with you, just saying that we need to follow this study you know, longer. It would be nicer if it had a larger number of people, but it's very hard to do nutritional research. Um, so I think that this delivers a nice message. So for those who may be a little cynical about the small size of that study and the short follow-up, here we go. So this particular study done by an exceptional researcher, this study was followed for almost 20 years with many, many women. And they had the women consume a low fat diet that was high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains. And what they found is that the women in the healthier diet group lived longer. They had a 21% reduction in breast cancer specific mortality by eating healthier, okay? I love being able to share this study. These are new results and it feels so good to finally have good science that we can connect with our patients and say, hey, this matters. So look, so we talked earlier about exercise, reducing the risk of breast cancer coming back by 50%, improving survival by 50%. Now we're talking about nutrition, that eating a low fat, healthy diet can really help to further impact that reduction in breast cancer coming back and improve overall survival. So pretty awesome stuff we're talking about. So let's go on to the various vegetables and fruits that are really important. And the first thing I would say is there is no one vegetable or fruit. There's a bunch of vegetables and fruits that matter. In fact, there's no bad vegetable or fruit. So if you're eating a vegetable or fruit, you get a green light, doesn't matter. But there's a few that folks uh, who come in to see me really like to hear about. So the first one we're gonna talk about is cruciferous vegetables. And I really love cruciferous vegetables for my breast cancer survivors. Cruciferous vegetables are rich in many, many very beneficial things. They're high in fiber, vitamins, minerals, there's anti-cancer phytonutrients, meaning that there's chemicals actually in the food that help to fight cancer. And research suggests that cruciferous vegetable may be associated with the decreased risk of breast and pancreas cancer. And in fact, here we look at this Women's Healthy Eating and Living study, and it had almost 1,435 breast cancer survivors who were on tamoxifen. 
And they showed that those women on tamoxifen who had the highest cruciferous vegetable intake had a lower risk of breast cancer coming back. Now, maybe that study doesn't apply to you, but I wanna show you this study. This is one of my favorite studies because it includes women with stage one to stage four disease. There were almost 5,000 breast cancer survivors. And what they showed in this study is that women with the highest cruciferous vegetable intake over 36 months after their breast cancer diagnosis had a reduced risk of the breast cancer coming back, a reduced risk of dying from any cause, and a reduced risk of dying from breast cancer. And you could look at these numbers here. So really exciting study. And I love that it included stage one to four patients. So I just want to show you this slide because when you see how powerful some of those studies are, you may wonder, well, what are Christopher's vegetables? So I won't name them all off here, but the common ones would be things like cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, broccoli sprouts, Brussels sprouts, arugula. I'll leave the rest there for you to go ahead and read or maybe even take a picture of the slide. So what is the best way to eat cruciferous vegetables? That's the trick. Well, they may be best to eat raw, but it sometimes is really hard to eat cruciferous vegetables raw. So what if I cook them? Do I lose some of that benefit of the cruciferous vegetables and those anti-cancer properties? You do, but there's a way to overcome it. There's a trick to the kitchen. So there's some kitchen wizardry we can apply. So basically what you wanna do is you wanna just sprinkle some dry mustard seed powder on your steamed cruciferous vegetables. Now you never wanna boil any vegetable in water. The best way to cook vegetables if you're gonna cook them is to steam them or maybe saute them in some olive oil or um, maybe you wanna roast them. Okay, again, never uh, cooking your vegetables in water. I also would really generally discourage patients from cooking vegetables in the microwave in a plastic bag. So it's totally fine if you buy them in the plastic bag that's microwavable, but maybe cut open that bag, put them in a glass container and cook them that way in the microwave, okay? Um, how much is too much cruciferous vegetables a day? You know, if you have hyperthyroidism, meaning your thyroid is too high, I would encourage you to speak with your endocrinologist to ask how much cruciferous vegetable is safe for me. Generally, one to three servings is gonna be safe for anyone and that would not be overdoing it. But I wanna encourage you to enjoy cruciferous vegetables and try to get a few servings in each day. So next, let's talk about the carotenoids. Again, here's that really wonderful study again, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study. It showed that carotenoid intake was significantly associated with reduced breast cancer uh, mortality. So women lived longer after their breast cancer diagnosis when they ate the most carotenoids. Now, as soon as you hear that word carotenoids, you think of carrots, right? There's about 40 carotenoids in your diet. So carotenoids actually are found in orange vegetables, but also yellow, red, and green vegetables, okay? So the Nurses Health Study had a bunch of women, almost 33,000 women who were followed for 10 years, and then almost 20,000 women at 20 years. And here again, this study showed that the, the women with the highest carotenoid levels had a much lower risk of breast cancer. I want to point out, because whenever you see some of these exciting studies, and you know that carotenoids can come in the form of a supplement like beta carotene, we quickly think about, oh, could that be a magic bullet? But the answer is no. And in fact, there's some studies, particularly among smokers and some prostate cancer studies, that have shown that beta carotene supplementation can actually be harmful. So we wanna avoid supplements. The food is the best way to get these vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. So the food is the way to get it. Eat it, don't take it in the form of, of a pill. There's also been studies that have shown that beta carotene supplementation is linked to increased cardiovascular mortality. And again, for women especially, we wanna avoid that being that heart disease is the number one uh, thing women need to watch out for. So soy. I should have asked a polling question about this because I think probably about 90% of women I meet with avoid soy because they're scared it's going to make their breast cancer come back. And that honestly can't be farther from the truth. So whole soy foods, things like tofu, edamame, soy nuts, soy milk, tempeh, whole soy food is actually very good for you and is safe for you. The American Cancer Society supports the consumption of one to two daily servings of whole soy foods a day, as does the American Institute for Cancer Research. In fact, the American Institute for Cancer Research shows that 
Breast cancer survivors who consume soy 12 months after the breast cancer diagnosis have reduced all-cause mortality. So I encourage my patients to enjoy soy if it's something they enjoy. If you don't enjoy soy, then you don't need to go out of your way to eat it. But if it's something you love and you've been avoiding it because of your breast cancer diagnosis, then by all means, you're safe to go ahead and consume one to two servings a day. The thing we want to caution against would be avoiding soy supplements and avoiding soy isolate protein powders or foods that are made with these soy isolate protein powders. So you go into the grocery store and you see that there's some high protein crackers or high protein cereal. First of all, that's gonna be processed food, right? But look at the ingredients. Oftentimes when you see these foods with added protein, even oatmeal with high protein, the thing they're adding to that is a soy isolate powder. That I do want my patients to avoid, okay? So whole soy in the form of natural food, thumbs up, great for you. Fake soy made in a manufacturing plant, bad for you, okay? Uh, on this slide, you see the, in really small print, these two research references. If you're not a Mayo Clinic patient, you can take a picture of that. You can share this slide with your medical oncologist. I do feel after your medical oncologist reads this, they too would have comfort with allowing you to have that one to two servings of soy foods a day. For those of you who have teenage daughters, we know that consuming soy during adolescent years is probably when the magical risk reduction occurs. So for my daughter, I actually have her consume soy milk every day. I've done that since she was a little girl. So soy is very good for our adolescent daughters, okay? So next, berries. These big words are these anthocyanins, pterostyl beans. These are those phytonutrients that offer a lot of the anti-cancer powerful effects. Let's look at this study. Almost 76,000 women followed for 24 years. They showed in this study, and I like this study because it showed a lower risk of one of the most aggressive breast cancers we see, an ER negative type breast cancer, simply for having two servings of berries a day. In the same study, they saw there was a 31% reduced risk in women who consumed at least two servings of peaches or nectarines a day. Now, this study requires further follow-up, but it sure is exciting to see that these vegetables and fruits confer this reduced risk of breast cancer and improved overall outcomes following a cancer diagnosis. I like to share this resource for you because oftentimes, uh, you know, folks are curious, well, should I buy organic or not? So you can go to this website, you can put this app on your phone. It's from the Environmental Working Group. What's in red is called EWG, again, Environmental Working Group's Dirty Dozen list. And what's in blue is the Environmental Working Group's Clean 15 list. So what's on the Dirty Dozen list is gonna be better to try to find organic, but if you don't have access to organic, say you're on vacation and you're eating out at restaurants a little bit more, but you're trying to stick to your plant-based diet, then don't worry about it. Just get it regular. Don't worry that it's not organic. But when you get home and you notice that the strawberries uh, that are organic are on sale and the organic spinach is on sale, maybe steer, you know, uh, be a little bit more fond of the organic in this section. But the Clean 15, these are the vegetables and fruits. You certainly don't have to buy organic. However, I would say if they're on sale and they're organic, yeah, organic may be a little bit more uh, beneficial. There's a lot of uh, theory to that, so I can't say that with strong evidence, but one would certainly say that if the plant is strong enough to withstand the elements and outlive the, the, the pests that try to eat them, then those phytonutrients may in turn be a little bit stronger, okay? So how many vegetables and fruits should you eat a day? All right, drum roll, are you ready for this? You see it seven to nine servings a day. That's a lot, I know, but that's what I want you to aim for. Five would be the minimum, but seven to nine, you get your gold star. So what is one serving? So one serving would be a half a cup of chopped or cooked vegetables, one cup of leafy vegetables, or one medium fruit. Okay, that's just a down and dirty quick way to think about it. You could always use your, uh, you know, Google or your Alexa or something and say, hey, Alexa, what is one serving of such and such? And, and she'll give you the answer. Um, but here's just a quick little reference for you. You know, what are some ways that you can make sure you nibble on these healthier foods and unhealthier foods? Keep a bowl of colorful fruit out on your countertop and grab a piece whenever you walk by it. 
and you know, try to, to have fun with your meals. Try new recipes. Stir fry is a great way to get lots of colorful vegetables in and try some fun seasonings too. So what about green tea? Looks really exciting when we look at these laboratory studies. These are called preclinical studies, meaning studies done before they hit the human studies, okay? So when we look at laboratory studies, green tea seems to be very effective against breast cancer. When we do these studies in the human being, it's a little bit harder for us to see that huge benefit, but we still think that green tea would be something we wanna encourage our patients to enjoy if they enjoy it. This wouldn't be something I would wanna encourage as a supplement because we know green tea as a supplement when it's taken as a pill can actually cause increased liver function. So we want to avoid that. But again, these laboratory studies actually show that green tea may have some beneficial effects with certain chemotherapies, very common chemotherapies that we had delivered to some of our, our breast cancer patients. So I share with my folks, you know, if you enjoy green tea, maybe have one to three cups a day. I have a little green tea with me today. I do enjoy it. I would uh, caution you, there's a little bit of caffeine in green tea. So if you're sensitive to the effects of caffeine, you get nervous, or your heart races, you may want to do the decaffeinated variety of that. And what about whole grains? Whole grains are loaded with antioxidants. Um, they have shown very favorable hormonal effects because of the high fiber you can get from whole grains. So, uh, and also it's very good for your gut microbiome. There's a lot about the gut microbiome now, the gut flora or the organisms you naturally have in your GI tract. These high fiber foods uh, that we get from whole grains are very, very beneficial. And there's actually been reports that high versus low grain intake has shown a reduction in many cancers by as high as a reduced 34% risk. So I encourage the consumption of whole grains. Um, there's no reason to have to avoid them. What about milk? So boy, the research is kind of all over the place with milk, right? But this life after cancer epidemiologic study actually showed that high fat dairy products increase the risk of breast cancer specific related deaths and all cause related mortality. They did not see this adverse effect with low fat milk. So if you enjoy milk or if you enjoy dairy products, please be careful with those and make sure those are low fat varieties. I typically like to limit my patients to no more than one to two servings of any dairy products per day. Red meat and processed meat. We know that processed meat is definitely a carcinogen, meaning it can cause colon cancer. We all have a colon. We all should probably avoid processed meat. Red meat, we believe, is associated with colon cancer. We believe both processed and red meat may have some adverse impact with breast cancer as well. Let's take a look at this. For those of you who have young adolescent daughters, I throw this slide in. We see that there's an increased risk of premenopausal breast cancer. What does that mean? That means breast cancer happening at a younger age in a woman. When these young girls consume the highest amount of red meat, versus those young girls that really only had it maybe once a week or less. And they saw in this study by replacing one of those red meat servings a day with poultry, fish, beans, nuts, that there was a 15% lower risk of breast cancer overall and a 23% reduced risk of these adolescent girls getting breast cancer at a really young age. So, you know, if your teenage daughter really loves her hamburger and she likes to have red meat on the go pretty frequently throughout the week. Maybe try to encourage her to switch some of those meals up if she's willing. But what about processed meat? So we see here that postmenopausal women who have 50 grams of processed meat, that's like two slices of ham or two pieces of bacon, that there's been a 64% higher risk of breast cancer. This was in a study that had 35,000 women. And we see in another study that looked at a bunch of studies. So this study took a study this study took a bunch of studies and it and analyzed to see if folks consumed the highest versus the lowest amount of processed meat, what happened? And again, they saw a higher risk of breast cancer. Grilling meat, when we cook meat on our grill, probably more of our Florida patients listening today than our Rochester patients. But boy, I'll tell you in Florida, I know we grill a lot here. It's just what we do. But it's something we have to be very careful with. High intake of grilled, barbecued, and smoked meat may be linked to worse outcomes after a breast cancer diagnosis. And it believes that that risk is about 23% and it's a real risk. So if you enjoy cooking on the grill, try to put those meats, first of all, try to marinate those meats. 
The American Institute for Cancer Research, if you search that online and you search grilled meats, how to make them healthier, there's a nice um, article they have on how you can grill meats the healthiest way possible. But ways to overcome that risk is to try to marinate your meat as well as cook it on the higher rack at a lower temperature, okay? What about fish? So the Mediterranean diet includes one to three servings of fish a day or uh, a week. Not a day, that would be way too much fish. One to three servings of fish a week. So dietary sources of fish fatty acids showed about a 25% reduction in breast cancer re uh, recurrence. And there was also reduced uh, breast cancer mortality. There's also been studies that show that maybe fish oil supplementation can help to optimize bone density in women taking aromatase inhibitors. Now, certainly we look at this first study and it says here loud and clear that the dietary sources are best. But in some situations, maybe women may benefit from fish oil supplementation that needs to be individualized. And I always like to uh, mention some caution because not all supplements are created the same. So it's important if your doctor does recommend fish oil that you make sure that the doctor gives you some options with the safest brand available so that you're not getting a brand that may be high in mercury count and that is not purified. So be very careful with that. Here is the Environmental Working Group Seafood Guide. So we see some of the best sources of fish would be things like salmon, sardines, mussels, rainbow trout, Atlantic mackerel versus maybe some of the worst choices, things to avoid would be these on the right-hand side. Things like king mackerel, you know, Atlantic mackerel is okay, but king mackerel would have a lot of mercury. Marlin, orange roughy, shark, swordfish, tilefish. So avoid those fish and allow yourself the fish to the left side of the screen. So in a moment here, we're gonna take a break, but one, one more thing here. Do cancer cells care if you're hungry? Probably depends, right? There has been some really exciting research over the past several years showing that a 13-hour prolonged fast overnight reduces the risk of breast cancer coming back. This effect, this benefit though, was not seen if the fast was less than 12 hours. So I encourage every single woman that I see or gentleman that I see to do at least a 13-hour fast every single night. And if you want to do longer, that's even better. I had a gentleman a few months ago, he did a 16-hour fast every night. He did it every night, seven days a week, and he was doing wonderful. So I encourage these overnight fasts. It's super easy to do. If you stop eating at 7 p.m. at night, you just don't eat until 8 a.m. the next morning. You're fine if you want to have a water or if you want to have tea or coffee. You just cannot put anything in those. You can't put non-nutritive sweeteners. You can't put cream, so it would have to just be plain, okay? So I encourage the fasting, great benefits. And for those of you joining us today who are trying to lose weight, here was a great study I just want to briefly point out where there was a 14-hour nightly fast, and over 12 weeks, these folks lost weight. They lost, on average, almost 7 pounds, as well as they had a reduction in body fat and their waist circumference. So we see that the fasting is critical when folks are trying to lose weight as well. So I know I've kept you sitting for a while, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a break here. And I'm gonna take you to a little video clip where we're gonna get you up and move for a few minutes because it certainly would be wrong of me to keep you sitting for, oh my goodness, it's been almost an hour, so perfect timing. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a Zoom witchcraftery here where I'm gonna kind of switch these screens around. So bear with me, folks. There we go. Many things you can do to incorporate fitness into your world and into your life. And that's a great thing. Johnson has developed an exercise program she says not only helps you get your exercise in during a busy day, but can also make you more productive at work. She calls it the Fab Five. It's a kind of a five simple exercises that you can do in the office to really help reinvigorate yourself. Uh, you know, a lot of studies have shown us that once we get up and move and we're active, we're more productive. She says it can take as little as five minutes to do chair squats, lunges, desk push-ups, chair push-ups, and toe raises. And those things can be really a wonderful thing and just re-energize. Okay, great. I'm going to come back to our slides. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you all to go ahead and stand up. 
And following these few exercises, we're gonna take some questions too. So if you have some questions while you're standing, you can type those into the Q&A or the chat, whatever is easiest for you. But what I would invite you to do, you know, we talked early in the exercise segment where we wanna avoid that sedentary time. So maybe stand up, pick two or three of these exercises and maybe do each one five times. Maybe try to do it 10 times if it's easy for you. And then we'll take those questions. So I'll give you a few moments, okay? I wish I could hear all your voices. I feel kind of lonely. It's so nice when I'm in a big room and I can see everyone's faces and we can laugh and have that human connection. But in COVID times, I guess this will work, but you're doing good. Go, go, I'm cheering you all on. Keep it going. <laughs> We have a few questions that came in through our Q&A. So okay, while they're doing the workouts, um, can you chat, talk about um, when uh, these patients should expect to receive their survivorship care plan? And if they haven't received it, um, what should they do about that? That's a great question. And it really depends on which campus you're on. Each campus is a little bit different. So our Florida campus, we generally deliver that survivorship care plan via the portal at about the one year mark once they've completed all their treatments. Now that is a new um, delivery process that we've implemented recently. Prior to that, patients would get and receive their survivorship care plan once they joined us in the survivorship clinic. But we felt that some of this education was really important earlier on. So we've started to do it earlier with conjunction of this uh, webinar. So if you haven't yet received your survivorship care plan, there's a good chance it's been completed. It's just in the portal and it's a little bit hard on the patient portal for some of our patients to access that. So feel free to send myself a portal message or Beth a portal message and we can help you receive your survivorship care plan in the portal. Alternatively, I have had some patients share with me their struggles with accessing it in the portal. So we'll just simply mail it to you or we can have it printed for you when you come to your next oncology appointment. At the Rochester campus, I believe all of those ladies or gentlemen who were invited to the webinar today were actually given their survivorship care plan at the time they were invited. So that, uh, those folks should be given a paper delivery. And in Arizona, my understanding is they have an electronic system that does a little different, it was part of a study, a little different form of the survivorship care plan than the one I shared for you. So your delivery is a little bit different than both Rochester's and Florida's. Um, but if you have any questions about that, please feel free to send us a portal message. We would love to make sure that you get your survivorship care plan. It has been a little bit of an obstacle for us upon switching to our new electronic medical record. Um, if you are a breast cancer survivor at Mayo Clinic Florida, I will share with you that there were a bunch of survivorship care plans that were completed on the old software system, so on Cerner. And so it's likely that your survivorship care plan is in there. It's just hard for you to see it. Also within our Mayo Clinic primary care providers, your survivorship care plan is sent directly to your primary care doctor. Okay, great question. For I would say definitely reach out to us if you don't have it because um, if you can't find it or you haven't been given that care plan, we can make sure that you get it. Yeah, and for doctors in the community, not all centers um, deliver survivorship care plans. The requirement is 50% of patients. So sometimes they're just select about who receives it and who doesn't. Um, so those resources we provided on that slide uh, with that Onco link, it has a beautiful survivorship care plan that you enter everything into and what it generates is incredibly educational. Um, so whether you're a Mayo Clinic patient or not, you may enjoy that resource as well. Are there and, any other? Yeah, one more question. What are your suggestions for managing food aversions? Beth, do you want to take that one? Do you have any experience with that? I recently had a patient, so I can answer that one too, but I'll, do you, have you encountered that? I'm not sure. I mean, what's the, I think it depends on what the situation is. Like if it's someone who's not getting complete nutrition, then um, finding a way to include foods that you are comfortable with and that you enjoy having to still have a nutritious balanced diet, that could be working with a registered dietitian um, to come up with something that fits all of your nutritional needs. Um, you know, I personally could say that there's, I have food aversions and I find ways to get that nutrition from other sources rather than from whether, whatever food I might be trying to avoid. 
Yeah, I agree with you, Beth. I recently just had a patient, haven't had one in quite some time with food aversions, and she had really strong food aver aversions, and it was related to her chemotherapy. So during chemotherapy, the food aversions are quite common, I would say, in my experience. Following completion of chemotherapy, it may even take up to a year for some of those food aversions to lift. But if those food aversions continue, I think like what Beth said, talking with a, a registered dietitian or one of our integrative nutritionists, I would recommend, this is where I really love to encourage the use of herbs and spices because it can really you know, make the food more flavorful and it can be truly enjoyable. So uh, the food aversions are a, are a tough part because oftentimes that's what transitions folks to just make more comfort foods or things that are simple and packaged. And sometimes the packaging is colorful and we think it's gonna taste good, but it's not. Um, it's not a very healthy food choice. Any other questions? That's all for now. I'll, t I'll share one more thing I sometimes get. Um, it's about alkaline water. It's a common question I get when I do my integrative supplements is, is alkaline water, you know, worth the money I'm buying it? I've had folks spend a, a few thousand dollars actually on an alkalinizing water machine for their house. And there's no research to support the need for that. The body is incredibly intelligent. And so what basically happens as soon as you consume that alkaline water, your body's gonna decide what it should do. And so it may start breathing a little bit faster to start blowing off um, some of the carbon dioxide, or it may actually slow down its respiratory rate to hold on to more carbon dioxide. And when your body does that, then it's gonna become more acidic again. And your kidneys tend to filter things differently, whether it wants to be more acid or not, it will change the pH of your body according to what the body needs to do to maintain what we call a state of homeostasis or balance. So the bottom line there is buying alkaline water it's, a, it's essentially a waste of money because your body is going to do with its pH or its acid base balance what it needs to do to maintain homeostasis, okay? The best way, so this is why I like answering this question, the best way to alkalinize your body is by consuming a plant-based diet. Lots of vegetables, lots of fruits. That's the best way to do it and the healthiest way to do it. A lot of folks ask me about coffee. Is it bad? Coffee's not bad. The bad part about coffee is what you put in it. So, you know, you want to avoid the heavy creams. You want to avoid sugar. You want to avoid fake sugar. A lot of folks ask me, well, what can I use then if I like a sweet flavor? Um, currently, I feel stevia is the safest. You may want to look for a non-genetically modified stevia um, or organic stevia because it is starting to be a little over-processed. Now, during your fast, you would not want to use stevia products though, okay? Because that sweet taste during your fast may be enough to trigger some insulin response. So that would be really important. That, that was a question that just came in, the best alternate sugars and also how to increase your hemoglobin. Oh, increasing your hemoglobin. I love that. That's a great question. So, you know, you want to first ask your doctor, I'm anemic. Is there, could there be anything nutritional that's making me anemic? The most common reason breast cancer patients get anemic during treatment is from chemo. It's not because you're iron deficient. It's not because you're B12 or folate deficient. It's because the chemotherapy did it. But the quickest thing people do when they hear I'm anemic is they start taking iron supplements. We're going to talk about a really interesting study here in a little bit, but iron supplements are actually very dangerous to take during chemotherapy unless you have a confirmed iron deficiency. And iron supplementation period, I try to avoid in all of my patients unless there's confirmed iron deficiency. So bottom line is don't go out and take iron unless the doctor tells you to because you're low in iron. If you're low in iron, then you do need it. Now, what about folks? We had a lot of folks who, uh, who answered the polls as being on plant-based diets or vegan. Now, those folks can develop and will develop a B12 deficiency if they're not taking B12 supplementation. So we'll talk about supplementation in a moment. But with supplementation, for all my folks who I'm prescribing a plant-based diet to, I typically have them take 1,000 micrograms of sublingual B12 once or twice a week. I don't have them take it a whole lot, but maybe once or twice a week. And then I will check their B12 maybe once or twice a year just to make sure on that plant-based diet that their vitamin B12 levels are adequate, okay? 
I agree. I think it's so important to understand why you're anemic before anything else. Make sure it's not a bleeding problem. Make sure it's not coming from a nutritional problem because so often it can just be the side effects from chemotherapy and your bone marrow just needs time to recover. Yeah. Any other questions? That's it for now. Okay, good questions. All right, well, we'll keep going. This photograph here is of our beautiful Florida campus, our beautiful Florida skies. So I have a few other photographs of our other campuses. It's just, it's grown substantially though over the years. So we'll go back to the American Institute for Cancer Research and our next recommendation is to limit alcohol. So let's go to a poll because this is something that I think is really important for us to make sure we understand the recommendation of, of where we need to be with alcohol. And the first thing we should ask is, what is considered one alcoholic beverage? Number one is a 16 ounce beer. Number two would be nine ounce glass of red wine. Number three would be a 1.5 ounce of vodka in your favorite mixed drink. Or number four would be, I have no idea, I believe in a generous pour regardless of what type of alcohol it is. I'll give you a few more minutes. I can see your answers. That's why I'm smirking. You guys probably wonder what she laughing at over there, but I can see your answers. And it's so cute because it'll, it'll all go one direction and they all change. I think people have, you know, answer remorse. They put their answer in. The, remember, I can't, I can't see who's answering what. Okay, good. So let's take a look at this. So we're going to share the results. So which answer is correct? So the right answer is number three. So a 1.5 ounce of vodka in your favorite mixed drink is actually equivalent to one alcoholic beverage. Wine would be a five to six ounce glass and beer would be one 12 ounce beer, okay? So that's important though, right? Because when we're gonna talk about alcohol, it's important that we counsel our patients according to how much alcohol is safe. Alcohol is actually attributable to 6.4% of all breast cancer cases. So alcohol is a carcinogen and it's linked to many other cancers as well. So we really want to start limiting, you know, our patients consuming alcohol. Any amount of alcohol does increase the risk of cancer, but the risk is quite small if you're consuming a responsible amount. Studies have linked that alcohol consumption among breast cancer survivors does increase the risk of recurrence and the risk of developing a second breast cancer. There doesn't seem to be any um, concern with a mortality um, problem. So that's good news, right? It, but it does increase the risk of breast cancer coming back. So how much alcohol is safe? And so what the recommendation is, is no more than one drink a day or no more than seven drinks a week. Okay. So we know our serving size and that's really important, but the problem is, is the majority of patients when they're enjoying their glass of wine, um, in particular, their, their serving size is definitely more than that five ounce pour. So you really want to try to, you know, take a look at your alcohol habit and try to reduce that. Um, I like for my patients not to have any more than one to three drinks a week. Um, so that is what I generally counsel. I don't like them to get up to that seven drinks a week limit. Again, we know any alcohol consumption increases the risk. The more you drink, the more problem it is. Um, so keep that in mind. I do think, again, those human, you know, connections, those rituals are really special and important. And alcohol has become kind of a mainstay in some of those social connections. And so I think there's nothing wrong with that. So maybe you just save your glass of wine um, or two for the weekend when you're having those social connections. But I wouldn't encourage having a glass of wine every night with dinner if you can avoid that. Okay. All right, so the next one is supplements. So we kind of tapped on that with the last question, but the bottom line here is there's no magic bullet. We wish there was, because if there was a magic bullet, we would be telling you to all take it and we would end this webinar really, really quick, right? But it's not that easy. And instead it takes a little bit of effort with eating a really healthy diet, taking care of our body, being physically active and managing stress. But this study was a really important study that was released. Um, in 2019, last year, right around this time, it was published showing that breast cancer patients who consume supplements before and during their breast cancer um, treatment actually didn't do as well. So that's why during your, your cancer treatment with chemotherapy and radiation in particular, we typically stop most supplements, except for those that would be necessary because of an underlying medical condition, or if there is a certain symptom 
because of your cancer treatment, let's say nausea, okay? We typically do very, very well at managing the vomiting with our anti-emetics that we prescribe you, but some women can still have some of the experience of nausea. So for that, we can do things like ginger. So we do sometimes prescribe ginger for our women or gentlemen undergoing cancer treatment. Um, but nonetheless, we want to discourage the use of supplements. This particular study looked at um, antioxidants like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, and CoQ10, as well as iron and B12. So we don't want breast cancer patients taking B12 if they don't need it. You should only take it if you're on that plant-based diet, you're not getting meat, and or there's concern for your B12 being low. And then when you are taking it, taking the appropriate amount is important, okay? So what about vitamin D? And in that particular study, there were two things that they did not see any risk associated with, and that was multivitamin as well as vitamin D. And so with vitamin D, there is research that shows that after cancer has occurred, having your vitamin D optimized, and if that means taking a vitamin D supplement to get your number to that uh, appreciable level, has been shown to result in improved cancer outcomes. So let me maybe restate that in a more simple way to understand. Vitamin D supplements do not help prevent cancer from occurring, but vitamin D supplements seem to help optimize vitamin D levels among cancer survivors. And subsequently, we see once we optimize that vitamin D level, those cancer survivors do best. So I do check vitamin D levels in my cancer survivors. I encourage any of you who aren't having your vitamin D level checked to just ask your doctor to check it. It's also important during COVID that you have your vitamin D levels optimized. The optimal range for vitamin D is over 35. That's that, so your vitamin D3 should be greater than 35 in your blood. But num the number of 50 is about the sweet spot where I like for my patients to be. And I don't want it much higher than 50 because as you approach 65, 70, 80 and get into those high vitamin D um, blood doses, it can increase your risk of kidney stones. So, you know, it's too much of a good thing is never good anymore. You got to find that sweet spot. So again, encourage um, your doctor to check your vitamin D level, find out where your vitamin D3 is at. That is the number we're looking for, your vitamin D3, and aim for a level between 35 and 50, okay? All right, so what if cancer survivors, you know, achieve six of these recommendations? So let's count. So what if we're a healthy weight, we're physically active, we eat our healthy diet, lots of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, we are not eating any fast food, we're not eating processed meat, we're limiting our sugar. That's six right there, right? Let's just throw seven in. Let's say we're also avoiding alcohol, okay? We see here that breast cancer patients, the research shows us, who meet at least six of these recommendations, have improved breast cancer specific survival, have improved overall survival, and they feel better. Their mental and their physical quality of life is better. And that's where I see patients get the buy-in, is once you feel better, you don't wanna turn back, okay? Good. So how is your sleep quality? This is really important. Do you snore? Do you toss and turn? Because sleep actually is a very important element for overall restorative um, well-being. And sleep actually plays a pivotal role in weight loss. So if you're not sleeping good, we certainly need to make sure we help you with that. And all medical centers do have sleep specialists to help with that. So here's a question for you. Let me launch this poll. How many hours of sleep should you get each night for optimal health and well-being? Number one is five to six hours. Number two is seven to eight hours. Number three is nine or more hours. Or number four is as long as you nap during the day, it doesn't matter how much you sleep at night. Woo, all my little students out there. This is incredible. Everyone got an A plus. Seven to eight hours is perfect. So actually research shows that if you sleep more than eight hours, if you sleep nine or more hours a night, there may be an increased uh, risk of depression with that. So really seven to eight hours is that sleep spot, uh, sweet spot. Is that sleep spot? I did just say that. <laughs> so seven to eight hours is the sleep spot. That's good. So there we go. That's our goal. Um, so try to maintain that ideal amount of sleep. Okay. Um, so let's next 
talk about a little bit of our mental well-being, a little bit of our stress management. And about 47% of our day is spent like this, right? And then we throw cancer on top of it. And boy, it gets ever so hard, right? Our mind is just all over the place. Nine times out of 10, that's why we can't sleep good at night, right? Is because we're processing so many different thoughts. But the goal is this, is to try to clear our mind. And when we clear our mind, just have peaceful, kind thoughts in our mind. We don't need our mind empty, right? That's not the goal. We want kind thoughts in our mind. So we're going to go to another polling question. So what I'm going to ask you is a little bit about your own emotional well-being. So our next question is here. In the previous 24 hours, how did your mind feel? Think back to that picture, okay? Did you feel like that picture, I was extremely distracted? You just had all this stuff in your head just going around. Or what about number two? I was able to focus but got easily distracted. Or number three, I was able to focus and did not get easily distracted. Or number four, I was able to focus, did not get easily distracted, and often looked at others with kindness. So I'll give you a few moments. Very interesting, good. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go ahead and cast your votes. You're gonna see your polls here in just a moment. So very interesting. So wow, I, I honestly never would have expected that 23% of attendees were number four. That gives me goosebumps. See, I like to have those good, those good feelings. Thanks for the good feelings. 23% of you, 13 of you made me feel good. So 13 of you attending this webinar were able to stay focused, did not get easily distracted and often looked at others with kindness. That's really awesome. That's great. And then number one, two, and three, if you selected those choices, there's a lot we can do to help you get your mind to a point where maybe it's more relaxed and that stress that you're experiencing in your life to where you have more of an outlet so that you can bring yourself to, to a more calming sense of existence because we know that stress is something that's not healthy for patients. So, you know, I encourage you to assess where you are now and determine what changes you wish to make, but that's kind of hard. You need a little bit of direction in doing that. At all three of our Mayo Clinic sites, there are stress management consults as part of our integrative uh, medicine program. So if you are a Mayo Clinic patient, talk with your care team and ask if you can meet with one of our mindfulness experts. It's a very valuable appointment. Most of our breast cancer survivors have um, been able to appreciate the experience of that particular consult. Um, and so I encourage you, if you're not a Mayo Clinic patient, it's something you can participate in. And at the end of this presentation, I'll give you some resources, particularly for those of you who aren't Mayo Clinic patients that it can help you. Um, so I'm going to just show you a short video here that I think has done really well to kind of go over some of these core concepts of, of mindfulness and stress management, okay? Hmm. Okay, I'm going to try that one more time. Sorry, folks, technical difficulties. Let me try that one more time, okay? okay let's try this again.
And if you ever want to watch that video again, you can just go to YouTube and just search for the mindfulness uh, video. You'll be able to find that. But I think that's a really nice, um, you know, snapshot of some of the very easy things we can implement into our daily life. And Dr. Amit Sood has written three books. Uh, Stress Free is one of the uh, books. And it's, it's such a shame we can't meet in person. Um, during our live retreats, we did, um, our last one was in February of this year, right before COVID, um, we were you know, sharing all the participants, giving them a copy of this book. This book is for sale online. You can't purchase it. Um, but the book goes over some easy ways that you can apply some of these concepts. So when you wake up in the morning, have a morning gratitude. Give thanks to something you're appreciative of. Or let's say you see your loved one come home from work or your child come home from school. You know, let's say they come, your child comes home from school and they're all dirty and their shirt's hanging out and their books or their papers are falling out of their backpack and you're so quick to judge, but instead just say, Oh, Johnny, it's so good to see you and give him a hug before we start judging about how, how he looks a mess, <laughs> you know? So we want to maybe just use that three minute rule. Just notice before we apply any judgment. Or what about kind attention? Let's say in the middle of the day, you're at work and it's just overwhelming. It's just, everything's piling up. You're getting all these emails, you're getting calls. What if you just put the pause button on for a few seconds and just send a, a silent wish of, of kindness to someone? Okay. And then the last thing here would be intentional thinking. And so one thing that you can do is give each day a thought of a higher principle. So for example, Monday would be gratitude. So today is gratitude. So let's just pause for a moment. I'll give you the next five seconds to just send a silent wish of thanks, something you're appreciative for since today is Monday. So go ahead and do that. You know, when we give thanks, oftentimes it kind of aligns our mind with something very positive. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this. But I think you would all enjoy that stress-free book. Um, I think it'd be a nice time right now. We've kind of covered a lot of information. And I'm sorry at the beginning portion of that, you know, delivery, I just kind of bombard you with so much content. But I know it's important content to get out um, to you all. So I hope you enjoyed um, some of that content, but I also want to make sure we balance all that knowledge of nutrition and exercise with the fundamental critical importance of how we manage our mental well-being. And we hear a lot about this right now, and this is kind of a unique time for all of us. It's a different world. We're missing our in-person social connections. And, you know, really it's not social distancing, it's more physical distancing, and we can certainly still have social contact like we're doing today not quite as good as if we could be in person, of course, but we're still having that social connection. But taking some time for yourself every once in a while is what's really important. So for the next three minutes, I'm going to just invite you to shut your eyes and enjoy this guided meditation. And at the end, I'll share this link with you as well so you can enjoy this in, in your own daily living. So enjoy this. Just shut your eyes and relax for a moment. Begin this meditation by noticing the posture that you're in. You may be standing or sitting or lying down. Notice your body exactly as it is and see if you can tune into any sensations that are present to you in your body in this moment. There might be heaviness or lightness, pressure, weight. There might be vibration pulsating, movement, warmth, coolness. These sensations can be anywhere in your body and all you have to do is notice them. Notice what's happening with curiosity and interest. Take a breath. As you breathe, relax. Not much to do except to be fully present and aware. Now let go of the body sensations and turn your attention to the sounds inside or outside the room. There may be all sorts of sounds happening, loud sounds, quiet sounds. 
You can also notice the silence between the sounds. But the sounds are coming and going. Notice them coming and going. One tendency of our mind is to want to think about the sounds, to start to make up a story about the sound, or we have a reaction to it. I like it, I don't like it. See it instead, you can simply listen to the sound. Notice it with curiosity and interest. The sounds are coming and going. Now once again, notice your body standing, present, or seated, or lying down. Notice any body sensations that are obvious to you. Take another breath. Soften. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Okay, wonderful. So I hope you enjoyed that. It's always nice to have just a moment to give back to ourselves for some relaxation. It's only three minutes, believe it or not, but after kind of resetting for three minutes, we all feel a little rejuvenated. Our focus, our clarity is a little better. That's something you could easily do, you know, in the middle of the day at work. So we'll give you that resource as we finish up today. So what about those of you when you were sitting there? It was kind of hard for you to sit still, though. There's always some folks that have, I'm actually one of those. So I'll confess. It's really hard for me to sit still. So something like yoga really works nicely for me. Um, I have a lot of patients that share that with me, too, that they just struggle with um, doing guided meditation. I also have some folks that share with me when they do a guided meditation, it feels a little bit off for them, but prayer works really good. So prayer is a, a form of meditating for folks, too. But things like yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong is awesome for those individuals who have a hard time sitting still and, and resting the mind. This allows you to move your mind while you're doing much of the same. And there's been some really nice breast cancer research that's shown that yoga among breast cancer patients has been very successful at reducing anxiety, mood disturbance, even depression. It improves quality of life and even energy. So there's less of this post-treatment reported fatigue, and it's excellent for insomnia. So I recommend to many patients, you know, there's so many different um, available free resources online nowadays that you can search for restorative yoga and do a few stretches and breathing exercises before you go to bed at night. And I talked to Dana before the presentation. I said, you know, should I keep that purpose slide in there? It's really something that I talk to patients about when I do one-on-one -on -one consultations. I sometimes don't always talk about it with patients. If they have a lot going on in their life, it's kind of hard to think about our purpose when we're just so distracted with so many other things and tasks we have to work at. But once we've kind of optimized many of these pillars of health and we're ready to kind of accept a few additional challenges, I think it's really important for us to take a look at our purpose in life, our meaning in life. What gives us value? This is truly when I think we are able to acknowledge our diagnosis as a gift. Sounds kind of weird now for many folks, especially when you're in the trenches of treatment or so close to treatment. But as your treatment becomes something of the past, you may be able to reframe your cancer diagnosis as something that gives your life new purpose. You know, whether that's volunteering at your child's school or whether that's volunteering at a nursing home, or whether that's maybe just writing letters to individuals undergoing cancer treatment to maybe give them words of encouragement or support. Okay, it doesn't matter really what it is. That's not for me to give you a suggestion. That's for you to figure out what is special and important for you. But it's important to live a life worth living and defining and finding your purpose is really what that's all about. 
So I want to encourage you to maybe start reflecting on this and thinking about this because I know for me, um, my purpose is doing what I do to help cancer survivors um, across the country now. The ability for this new virtual world, even though COVID has been something really hard for us to accept, the most incredible part for me about COVID is now we're able to have this broader touch. We're able to do these virtual platforms and give people these little bits of information. And if I can just help one person with one element of their life today, then that was worth it. So purposeful living is what I wanna really encourage all of you to put as one of your goals and take home messages for today, okay? So this is something that I think is really exciting. Compared to women who are socially integrated, women who are socially isolated are more likely to have their breast cancer come back, are more likely to die from any cause or die from their breast cancer. And the mere fact that you all connected with us today means you're one of these socially integrated individuals. So how awesome is that? And I wanna share this really nice resource with each of you. We have a really wonderful virtual support group community that is um, taking place. This is taught by Liz Matson and Kristen Lofman. Liz is part of our Humanities and Medicine uh, Division and Kristen Lofman is our mindfulness expert at Mayo Clinic Florida. And we have opened up all of our support groups to anyone who wants to attend. So here is the link. And so you could take a photograph of this and you can type in all those words, which would be painful. That would cause stress. And then you would need to do that guided meditation immediately afterwards. Or we will go ahead and email this invite to you because I believe we have all of your email addresses um, when you signed on for today's uh, webinar. So we'd love for those who attended the webinar to join us. Something really unique this month is since it's Breast Cancer Month, we're offering this support group weekly. And then following Breast Cancer Month, it'll be offered monthly. And so I find that the support group, I've gotten wonderful feedback from my patients. So I wanted to share this resource with all of you today. And then just two more quick slides. You know, I, I have had a very special patient of mine attend this a retreat in the past. And she said, you know, Dawn, you didn't talk about acupuncture or massage. And I thought, you know, I didn't. And I'm going to just mention two brief slides on it. Because for women who are experiencing a lot of side effects following uh, cancer treatment, acupuncture can serve to be a really wonderful modality to help to reduce those effects from care. Acupuncture just involves a very tiny like monofilament needle that stimulates different points on the body to promote now this sounds kind of weird, but this is what it does. It promotes the internal energy to have a proper flow. And so it helps to remove different blockages in the body. This is traditional Chinese medicine. These are ancient healing techniques. And look at this list of things that it can help. The areas where you see stars or double stars or triple stars are areas where there has been ample amounts of breast cancer research showing benefits. So for anxiety, depression, chemotherapy associated nausea, vomiting, cancer-associated pain, neuropathy, headaches, fatigue, hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, improved quality of life, can help lymphedema, it can help weight loss, and it's wonderful to help tobacco or alcohol sensation as well. Some patients are scared and fearful of needles. I've had many patients share that with me. They've gone to see the acupuncturist and it was not a fear they had once they met the acupuncturist and the therapy was explained to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we offer acupuncture at all three Mayo Clinic sites. Uh, for those of you that are not at Mayo Clinic or in the local community where we have a Mayo Clinic facility, you can research to find a credible acupuncturist by looking up N is in Nancy, C is in cat, C is in cat, A is in apple, O is in opposite, M is in Mary, nccaom.com. You put in your zip code and you will get a very nice list with a particular mile radius you're interested in for finding a very good acupuncturist in your local community, okay? And then massage therapy, another treatment we offer at all three Mayo Clinic sites. Um, in fact, when we initially started our integrative medicine program at Mayo Clinic, we even piloted doing massage in the inpatient setting. I know at Mayo Clinic Rochester, they do massage at the inpatient setting. Um, so we are very much... Um, encouraging of the importance of massage to help mood with reduction in anxiety, depression, overall well-being can enhance your energy, enhance your immune system. It can help lymphedema and reduce pain. 
So key takeaway points. I mean, gosh, we covered a lot, right? So I think, you know, in the very beginning, we wanted to highlight what a survivorship care plan is all about. We did that quite briefly, but the importance of that brief discussion was just to know and recognize the late effects of cancer treatment and signs and symptoms of recurrence and to highlight the American Cancer Society cancer screening guidelines for average risk patients. We didn't go into too much detail about that, but if you have had breast conservation therapy where you preserved your breast tissue, you still need to do mammograms every year. Okay, that's very important. You typically start that first mammogram one year from the time of your original diagnosis. In some cases, that may need to be done earlier if they were following something, but generally it's at the one year mark. But you shouldn't forget about your other body parts, right? So cervical cancer screening, if you still have a uterus, a colorectal screening, lung cancer screening, and if you have a, uh, if you have a significant tobacco history, what that lung cancer screening is, uh, screening is, is if you're eligible for a CAT scan of the chest to make sure there's nothing going on in your lungs. For patients who are still struggling with tobacco addiction, you know, it is not something I actually talked about today because it's just not something that I commonly see. And as part of the American Institute for Cancer Research guidelines, it is assumed that folks know that tobacco is a carcinogen. It leads to cancer. So we don't go into too much detail about that because we assume folks know that but it's here to just encourage those of you who are smoking to know we are here to support you. We do have tobacco cessation support services at all of our campuses. And if you need help with that, please let us know. We wanna encourage you as a key point to work at maintaining your body weight, trying to avoid weight gain. Don't sit around, get moving, set a timer every 60 to 90 minutes when you're uh, doing your work so you can stand up and maybe do the, the fab five, you know, maybe do five to 10 of those exercises eat a whole food, plant-based diet that's rich in an abundant, colorful of vegetables and fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts, um, seeds, avoiding processed foods, avoiding alcohol. But if you have a special social event, you know, knowing what your serving size is and that it's probably okay to have, you know, maybe one to three drinks a week. Um, staying away from all forms of tobacco. Oh, I had it on there. See, I, I got ahead of myself. Practicing stress reduction techniques. We gave you a few resources um, that we went through today and I'll highlight those in just a slide here in a moment. Here's an important takeaway is show up for yourself. You know, all these things we talked about took time. If this was a loved one who was going through the journey you went through, you would encourage your loved one to do these self-care measures. So show up for yourself, you matter, you're important. And then lastly, discover your life's purpose. So here's a few resources in closing that I wanna share with you before we answer some, lasting, uh, some last questions. The American Institute for Cancer Research, I talked about quite a lot today. They have a cancer survivorship platform. It's called iThrive. That is an incredible resource. You go into their website, you complete this written questionnaire, and from there they actually tailor a lifestyle program with you that's focused around the five health pillars. So it looks at nutrition, your movement, your environment, rejuvenation, and spiritual well-being. So I think you would really enjoy that. So another one that's an app, so the iThrive I find is easiest to do on the computer. The My Wellness Coach is an app from the University of Arizona where Andrew Weil has his integrative medicine program and many of our integrative physicians at Mayo Clinic have done advanced training through uh, Andrew Weil's school. This particular app is lovely. It again goes over the core values for making healthy, lasting lifestyle change. So I think you will really enjoy the My Wellness Coach app as well. Um, and here's an extremely busy slide, but here you will find some of those stress management resources. Um, the, the first section are some Mayo Clinic affiliated mindfulness and resiliency resources. The bottom section are some other apps that aren't Mayo Clinic affiliated, but ones we find helpful. In fact, this UCLA mindfulness link, this website, is where they have the uh, body and sound meditation, and that's the brief uh, uh, guided meditation we did today. Okay, so you can take a screenshot of that, and some of those may be very useful for you in your own personal life. I'll give you a moment if you wanna take a photo of that. Okay, and I think we can go to questions. This photograph here is of our cancer center at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. Here, here again, another beautiful sky. 
So we could take some questions. I have one more picture of the Mayo Rochester campus. This is Sister Alfred um, in this statue here. Um, and I just think if you saw the Ken Burns documentary, this photograph was actually in that particular documentary, the story of Mayo Clinic. So let's take those questions. Yeah, Are you ready to um, One, how much physical work can a patient with a mastectomy uh, having chemotherapy do? Great question. So that's something you would want to ask your surgeon. Of course, it depends um, how far out you are from your surgery. I know at Mayo Clinic Florida, we encourage our patients to walk as soon as possible. So we want to encourage walking essentially immediately. Um, now, with, when it comes to yoga and some resistance exercises, there is going to be a delay for some of those. Um, in talking with our surgeons um, and our exercise rehabilitation specialists, I've asked about the overhand movements. And they generally recommend that right away as well. We want you to move your extremities, but maybe not with resistance right away. So awesome question. You know, if you have in mind a particular exercise that you're really enthusiastic to get back to, maybe sending your surgeon a message and say, hey, you know, I'm four weeks out, I'm six weeks out. I want to start back with this particular exercise and see if they give you the green light. You may be surprised. I, ha I have myself been surprised. I've seen patients where my appointment is before the plastic surgery follow-up. And I said, oh yeah, you probably should do it. And then the plastic surgeon said, oh yes, go ahead. So they're very, they're very um, motivated to get patients back to activity as soon as possible. Of course, walking, I don't see any restriction at all with that. Resistance exercises when you're using your upper body, there will be some restriction, let them guide you, okay? And I'll kind of address the oncology side because they mentioned chemotherapy. And um, I think you're going to have more restrictions from a surgical standpoint than from the chemotherapy standpoint. We also encourage patients to remain active throughout their chemotherapy. Um, you're going to be limited by fatigue. Um, there may be issues with your white blood cell counts are low where we want to stay away from environments like a gym where you might be um, more exposed to infections. But we want to encourage patients with chemotherapy to remain active also. And I think walking is a is something everybody can do. Yeah, that's a great point, Beth. Thank you for picking up on that part of the question. Um, you know, there's been research looking at breast cancer patients who exercise during treatment, and those individuals have less side effects because of their treatment, and they have improved breast cancer outcomes. There is research ongoing at this time to even investigate having individuals exercise, are you ready for this? During the chemotherapy infusion. How cool is that? So we'll have you actually sit and pedal an ergometer while you're receiving your chemotherapy. So yes, I very much encourage exercise all through chemotherapy. How much would be too much? I typically tell my patients no more than two hours a day. I know that sounds crazy, but I've had a few patients that have wanted to do more than two hours a day. So I do limit them at a two hour a day limit during chemotherapy. After they've completed all their treatments, I defer that question um, if someone really wants to do more like two plus hours of exercise a day to our exercise rehabilitation specialist, we have to make sure that we're not creating too much of an oxidative stress is the problem. Sometimes too much exercise um, is an ideal, but, but believe it or not, usually we can let patients get up to about three um, hours a day very, very safely um, once they've completed their chemotherapy treatments. And sometimes even a little more than that if we know they're eating an adequate diet getting proper rest and restoration that their exercise um, uh, regimen is one that would be well balanced. So we work with our exercise experts to help guide us as to what those exercise goals should look like when the numbers start to get into those, you know, 21 plus hours a week exercise commitments. Yeah, I, th I certainly want to agree with what you said with it has to be balanced because you don't want to set yourself up for injury and then not be able to be physically active either. Exactly right. And start slow. You know, you don't want to be a weekend warrior where you haven't, you know, sometimes these talks, we hope these talks are really empowering, but we don't want the take home message to be like, I'm going to go walk 60 minutes tomorrow because I just feel on top of this world. I want that eventually, but maybe start with a five to 10 minute walk. Then if you feel great at lunchtime, go do another five to 10 minute walk. If you feel great at dinner, maybe do another five to 10 minute walk and increase each week you know, up to five minutes for each of those walks. I love um, steps per day as well. So there is going to be a study published soon with those results released. I don't know what the results look like, but we believe that 10,000 steps a day is the goal to work towards. 
So if right now you are monitoring your steps and you're only getting about 2000 steps a day, we're going to slowly want you to increase those steps. And I typically encourage, you know, women each week to add an additional 250 to 500 steps. It's going to take some time, right? So take it slow. If you have energy after increasing 250 to 500 steps week two, then the next week, add another 250 to 500 steps. You still feel good? Increase the next week. So stepwise approach, working up to a goal of 10,000 steps a day would be the goal. Okay. Another question that came in from one of the attendees is um, asking if you could mention the uh, estrogen containing food that, that was in the nutrition part, food that I guess contains some estrogen. Okay, so that's probably about the soy, I would assume mm. that that they're talking about. So when it comes to soy, the myth would be is that there's phytoestrogens in that soy that would be harmful to a breast cancer patient who has a history of an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And again, the American Cancer Society, the American Institute for Cancer Research, both support it's safe to have soy containing foods one to two servings a day. So there are other foods that are believed to have potential soy, uh, I'm sorry, are believed to have potential estrogen-like properties in it. Um, flaxseed, for example, is believed to have some estrogenic-like properties. But again, it acts very similar to that of soy. It's more of a favorable, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And the research in breast cancer patients with soy actually looks quite favorable. There's been some research looking at flaxseed and hot flashes that didn't really show a benefit in hot flashes, but we know that flaxseed is still likely very safe for breast cancer survivors. Now, would I say to have five tablespoons of flaxseed a day? No, but I think one to two tablespoons of flaxseed a day is very good for you. I, I love the fact that you're getting a vegetarian source of omega-3 fatty acids. I love the fact you're getting a lot of fiber. I like flaxseed that's milled better than I do flaxseed oil. The flaxseed is gonna have fiber in it and the fiber is very, very important. The flaxseed oil is not gonna have the fiber. So I don't like flaxseed oil. I'd rather you have the actual flaxseed so you get that fiber. The best way to have flaxseed is to mill it. So you buy a coffee grinder, you buy the whole flaxseed, you mill it in a coffee grinder and then put it in your refrigerator. It's pretty, um, stable, I've read up to up to three weeks stable. I would rather you just mix or mill enough so you have enough for a weekly serving and then remill it again the following week so you're sure it's fresh. It can go rancid if you don't refrigerate it, so it's important to refrigerate it. Um, there's many other foods that, I can have, that can have possible estrogen properties in it. For example, turmeric. It's probably one of the most common supplements I see uh, patients take. Turmeric can be great for osteoarthritis. Turmeric can be great for joint pains. Um, there's some ongoing research studies with the use of turmeric or curcumin. It's one and the same. Um, in women taking aromatase inhibitors to see if it can get rid of the joint pain. Um, but those studies haven't yet been concluded. So we have to wait and see how the safety looks. Is it safe for women to take curcumin and aromatase inhibitors? And does it work? Does it even help the joint pain? It's always safe to eat turmeric as a food. The estrogen properties in turmeric would not be considered a problem when it's consumed as a food. When it's consumed as a supplement, I don't think we have enough information yet to answer that question. So again, it comes down to that answer, food makes us feel safe. As a supplement, we start to scratch our head. I wish if this person wants to add a little more to their question, if there's a particular food you had in mind, with possible estrogen properties, let me know. The only last thing I would mention is animal products are gonna always have hormones in it. It's the mere nature of being an animal, you have hormones. So even if you buy organic hormone-free meat, there's still gonna be hormones, okay? Because the animal naturally had hormones. The organic is gonna be a little bit better. The grass-fed is gonna be a little better because there's gonna be a little more omega-3 in it. But that's why I do limit animal consumption among my cancer survivors and uh, women undergoing treatment because we know that animal products do have hormones. So red meat, poultry, um, dairy products, and eggs. All of those things I limit. When it comes to eggs, I really don't want my breast cancer patients having any more than two to four eggs a week. 
Um, and if you're purchasing eggs, it's best to get the omega-3 eggs. So at least if you're going to have it, you get a little bit more omega-3 than you would if you weren't going to have it. Okay. And with milk, we already talked about milk, no more than really one to two servings of that a day would be where I would want to limit patients and any dairy should be low fat. But if there's a certain food, the person who wrote that question has a query about, please send that question and we'll get that answered. We had another attendee that asked if you could um, just talk a little bit more about uh, weight gain, um, what, you would, what to do regarding weight gain after being on an AI and even having surgery. Yeah, that's such a great question because, you know, we really want to start tackling the weight gain at the time a woman's diagnosed, right? We don't want to encourage weight loss. Like, as you're newly diagnosed, it's not the time for us to necessarily um, start a weight loss program. My goal at the time of diagnosis is to avoid weight gain. And then once the cancer treatment is done, then we start weight loss, okay? Um, so to answer that question, I feel the number one thing that helps is weighing yourself every day to kind of keep track of what's going on with your body weight. So if the scale starts going up, you can talk with your doctor about possibly being referred to a weight loss or a weight management specialist to help you right there. Because sometimes what happens is we kind of lose track of things, right? And it's like a blink of an eye for six weeks later and it's six pounds. And, and how did that happen? So if you weigh yourself every day, it can be very helpful. If that's a stress to you, then maybe just weigh yourself once a week, okay? If you do weigh yourself every day, I recommend weighing yourself as soon as you wake up in the morning after your first void, that's gonna be the most consistent time. And then don't weigh yourself the rest of the day. Don't weigh yourself after you eat a heavy dinner or something like that, because it's not gonna be accurate. So one time a day in the morning after your first void. The key during cancer treatment um, for me is I love to initiate fasting in all of my patients. And if weight loss is the goal for my patient, rather than the 13 hour fast, I do have them do more of a 14 hour fast since the studies do show that nice weight loss um, in that one study that was published in Cell Metabolism that I shared with you. So I encourage fasting 14 hours every night. If the woman says, well, you know, I'm good to do 15 to 16 hours, thumbs up. I support an overnight fast up to 16 to 18 hours. Um, and that would mean that you would just have more like a six to eight hour eating window if you were gonna do that longer fast at night. So fasting would be number one. Number two would be the exercise, working up to three hours um, a week of exercise. And then that sedentary time, if you're sitting during the day, because you're so pooped out from doing your three hours of exercise, we're kind of defeating the purpose. So set a timer to make sure you're getting up, maybe doing your fab five exercises every 60 to 90 minutes during that sit time. The other thing would be your sleep, making sure you're getting seven up to, but not more than nine hours of sleep. If you're not sleeping adequately, there is very poor hormonal balance of the important hormones that help us lose weight like leptin and something else called adiponectin. So it's important that we optimize our hormonal state by getting good quality sleep. Who would have known that, right? So if you're not sleeping because we just put you on an aromatase inhibitor, well, gosh, we need to help you because maybe that's part of why you're not losing the weight. And then nutrition. That's something that I work closely, even though I have um, a strong expertise in you know, cancer fighting foods, I work directly with my nutritionist to help us with weight loss plans because the calorie calculation needs to come from them. The calorie calculation will change with time. So after you start losing weight, let's say it's six weeks, eight weeks later, and you've started to lose six pounds, maybe 10 pounds, we may need to pull the calories down a little bit lower to account for some of that weight loss you've seen. That's generally what um, results in plateaus. You know, we're doing great. We lose weight origin originally, and then all of a sudden we stop losing weight. That's when we need to take a sneak peek in and find out what we need to fine tune. And usually we need to adjust the caloric intake at that point in time. So it's a multidisciplinary approach to weight loss. A lot of elements go into it. That's why it's so complex and that's why it's not easy. And we're very compassionate and empathetic to the needs that you have. And we want to be there to help you. Okay. All right. We have a few more questions. I know we're almost uh, at 12 o'clock, but uh, two more questions that have come in. One is concerning or just asking a little bit more about vitamin D and calcium. I'm wondering if the amount of vitamin D in a daily vitamin is enough or if there's a certain type or amount 
of vitamin D that you recommend per day. And, um, and this uh, attendee is actually on an AI and wondering if it's recommended to also take a calcium supplement. Beth, do you want to take that one? I can certainly answer that one too. I can tell you what we say from an oncology standpoint, and then you can kind of clarify if there's anything from your nutrition background that you want to add. Um, I don't, I don't recommend like daily multivitamins, you know, I'd rather target specific nutritional needs. So um, I stay away from recommending any kind of daily vitamin at all. A um, thousand I use is what we typically recommend for vitamin D. But um, like Dr. Musiala mentioned earlier, checking your levels to make sure, because I've certainly seen women that are on a vitamin D supplement that had higher than anticipated uh, vitamin D levels. Um, so it may need to be tailored specifically. I've also seen women on a thousand I use daily that weren't meeting that goal. So some women need a higher supplement. Um, calcium, it did, we generally would recommend calcium with vitamin D if we're seeing bone density loss when you're on the aromatase inhibitor, but keeping in mind that too much calcium can certainly lead to issues with deposits on our blood vessels or kidney stones. Um, so calcium generally in your diet is gonna be the best. Um, and then, you know, if there is a calcium plus D supplement that could be used, so again, looking specifically at the need for calcium and vitamin D rather than taking a multivitamin. Yeah, I agree with everything Beth said. You know, with calcium, there's been studies to show that the best way to get calcium is from your food much more than from a supplement. And a lot of those studies have shown that calcium supplementation really may not help bone fractures anyways. You want to get, again, your calcium from food. So I recommend doing a calcium food diary. I recommend food diaries anyways. I think it's great to write down what you eat calculate out your calories, but maybe spend two or three days writing everything out you eat, use your Google or Alexa and ask how much calcium is in this food? And then write it down, calculate how much calcium you get for the day. The goal is going to be about 1200 milligrams of dietary calcium. That's going to be my goal. If you don't meet that 1200 milligrams, let's say you just get 600 milligrams, then you would want a 600 milligram calcium supplement. Not all calcium is treated the same. Calcium carbonate is junk. So Tums, is junk. Calcium citrate is great. That's much more um, favorable to absorption into bone health, we believe. Um, please know that you do not need to get your calcium supply from dairy. Um, you can get your calcium from green leafy vegetables, from soy. There's many other ways to get healthy calcium. It does not have to be um, from dairy. Sardines are a great way to get your calcium plus some omega-3s. So keep that in mind when you're doing your food journal. Don't just think about the milk-like products that would give you calcium measure it in all the foods you're consuming, okay? The nut milk, so cashew milk, almond milk, most of those are fortified with calcium as well. So keep that in mind. Um, I totally agree with Beth. I think a good starting point for vitamin D is about a thousand international units a day. Have your level checked and then individualize that dose according to what your blood test shows us. It needs to be individualized. And remember, you don't have to get your vitamin D from a pill. Ideally, I'd rather you get it in nature so go outside in the sun, let your head, let your chest, let your arms be exposed to the sun. Try to do that 10 minutes twice a week. That's really the key to optimal vitamin D is time outdoors. And we believe that's why the cancer risk reduction studies with vitamin D supplementation never showed a benefit. We know that higher levels of vitamin D fight cancer, but that's because those people are out in the sun exercising, spending time in nature and they're getting natural vitamin D accumulation. As soon as we give those people a pill, that benefit goes away because we know you can't just sit inside on your behind all day, not doing much. So time outside, being active is really the key. But if we can't get the level optimized in doing just that, then we need to take an additional pill. And the majority of folks I work with do need supplementation. Certain things increase the risk of vitamin D supplementation. One of those is a darker skin, actually, those folks have a little bit harder time getting their vitamin D levels up. So that good questions from these, from our <laughs> audience. If we can go over time, I think, so we can keep going with the questions. I'm yeah. okay. Time. Perfect. We have one more that has come in. Um, what are your thoughts about domesticated buffalo milk for breast cancer patients? You, if you, any. Some <laughs> professor. I don't know. I have no idea. No, <laughs> But I wish the attendee could talk because sometimes our patients have knowledge. I will be the first to look that up because I'm extremely curious. I learn so much from my patients. 
that's one of my most favorite parts about my job is I learn every day. I'm always learning. Um, so very interesting. I don't know much about it. Um, you know, the biggest problem with dairy is the casein. Um, well, the biggest problem with milk is the growth hormone and all the hormones we're getting from the milk. Even if it's organic milk, there's still hormones in it because the cow has hormones. And a lot of our milk comes from pregnant cows. Now, in this case, from buffalo, I don't know what the proportion of what's and what looks like in that. The other big problem with dairy products, though, is the casein. It's very pro-inflammatory. And inflammation really drives um, tumor growth. So we want to get rid of things that are inflammatory. And so I would assume, just because milk is milk and casein is casein, I would assume buffalo milk has casein in it. So I would think there's still inflammatory properties. But I have to look it up. And those are all the questions that have come in. Does anyone else have any questions that they want to send in the chat or the Q and A? This is great. This is really fun. <laughs> I hope we had this opportunity. Thank you all for your awesome questions, your participation, and for the honor of your time. It's just a humbling experience and. I know Beth is like me. I get so energized from these events. So I thank you for my energized morning. <laughs> Have a great day. Yours in health. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.